Hello there, I'm Black Bright and I broadcast out of the east of England and I'm hoping that I find myself into your homes with you feeling well and blessed and thank you for allowing me to take up some of your time. And if you would like to press the like button, it does um, notify YouTube that the content is pretty okay for people to watch. So yeah, um, I've been getting a lot of views, but nobody's been clicking on the like button. So if you could, especially when I hear some of your comments, if you just take a second to click on it, that would be great. And for those of you who want to subscribe, then thank you. Um, and for my subscribers, thank you very much for supporting me. Um, somebody asked me to talk about um, what it feels like to be black and British. And it's a, it's a funny, um, I thought it would be a straightforward question. But when I thought about it, it isn't straightforward at all. There's a part of me that loves being black and British. There's a part of me that loves the English language, that loves the um, sense of privilege I have in certain areas. Um, there's a part of me that loves the fact that I can go here, there and everywhere um, to a degree. There's another part of me that's sceptical, that's cautious, that's wary. And I think that comes from um, the fact that in the English culture is not transparent. Let me put it that way. I think that's where it comes from. I always feel as though there's an undercurrent of something going on. So whereas I would love to embrace the moment, and indeed I do, I, I like to think that how I'm living is how I can live. There always seems to be a kind of an undercurrent going on, something that's not quite right. And I think that makes me feel unsettled. And I guess, um, well, let's start from the beginning. I was, let's start at the very beginning. It's a very good place to start. I think that was Mary Poppins. I think so. Anyway, um, or was it The Sound of Music? I can't remember. Anyway, um, let's think about my education at school. When I think about my education at school, I thought it was great. I was always getting A's in English. I was getting A's in art. I loved sociology. I didn't really like PE. I was useless at geography, useless at history and maths useless so i'm a creative being but it didn't occur to me uh, when we were learning about history and all that stuff that so much of our history had been obliterated from the curriculum so then you kind of i kind of felt that i had no one to relate to and then me being bored well, me being born in Britain at a time when there wasn't many blacks in, of my age group in the schools and in the home that I was raised in, I didn't really have anybody to identify with. So most of my surroundings were white and the lady who looked after me, one was white and one was Anglo-Indian. They were the people who I saw. And so... I didn't even realise I was a woman of colour until I went to secondary school. That might seem bizarre, but if something's not drawn to your attention, you're not going to know. So back in the day, black people were called coloureds and darkies. That's what they used to call us. But I never got called a darkie and I never got called a coloured. So at, growing up, Let's say um, up until maybe the age of eight, I wasn't aware that I was black and British. I mean, you don't even think about your heritage or where you're born as a child. You grow up, you, you're, you're, you, you kind of adapt to your surroundings and 
your parents, depending on how they treat you, that kind of forms your personality, your character, and it forms your identity to a degree. So um, the black British part of it never really played a role until I went to secondary school. And then being black was brought to my attention, as I've mentioned in previous videos, when black girls who started coming into the school when I was in my fourth year um, and forced me to recognise that I was different by saying to me, do you think you're white? Um, and, you know, you're a traitor or something. I can't remember their exact words. And at that point, I had to look at myself and look at them and look at my friends who I had been, um, who had been my friends, and realise that, oh, yeah, my skin is different. My skin is like those girls' skin. But I wouldn't have known that. And that's why they say racism is taught. You know, people, children don't grow, grow up feeling different. They don't grow up pointing fingers. They don't grow up believing that people are different. And I saw a video the other day where a black man was talking to a little baby and it went viral, a little white baby. Why would that go viral? And somebody wrote um, no difference in age and gender and all kinds of stuff. It's like it was something unusual for a black person to be um, comforting a white child. But my point is, is that being black and British, as you grow older, you are made more aware of the differences. And it's only when I was made more aware of the differences and being treated in certain ways, in certain, sense, in certain situations, that I kind of had some reservations. But prior to that, you know, minding my own business, England is a great place to be. And sometimes even now, you know, England is a great place to be. What makes it not great is when you are forced to recognise that there is racism. And that's what makes England, being black and black British, so uncomfortable because you would like to think that being black and British is just like being white British, only that, you know, for categorisation or political um, points, you're distinguished for whatever reason. But it's not like that. So um, the UK is omitting different histories, claiming that black people are not a part of this country and therefore their history is unimportant. So it's hard to wave the black British flag with pride when we are reminded to go home we don't want you here. We can strip you of your citizenship, even if you're born here. So you've got this um, allegiance on the one hand of being British. And then you've got these messages that pop up every now and then, alienating you from your Britishness. And so being black and British is like an anomaly. So like an anomaly, because you, you kind of, it's kind of, unstable it's it, it the two don't gel the two words don't seem to gel you know it would be great if people could just forget about the prefix black asian british black british african british or whatever other kind of britishes there are and just call people british but they don't want to do that or even if they just called people of color or foreign nationals british and then called themselves English. But this, um, this having to make a difference, having to create a category called Black British makes, makes me feel uncomfortable as a Black British. You know, I would prefer not to be categorised. I would prefer just to be Myrna Loy, female, that's it. But that's not the way it works for a variety of reasons. So I was born here, I was schooled here, I've worked here, um, 
I've had fun growing up, quite naive about racism. And um, I think my, my parents and other black people, children's parents took the brunt of racism because we didn't know what was going on. I know my mother told me once that somebody put something through the letterbox and told her to go home. But even then, the concept of racism wouldn't have been clear in our minds about how that might have felt for my mother in particular. Because my mother was a determined woman. And I don't know whether, I think she just took that um, house on that street because it had a sitting tenant. Um, and it was a cheaper way to get a house. But I don't think she knew that she would have been the only black person on that street and it might have caused a problem. But regardless, she stuck it out until she passed away. Um, so for me being black British, I think about the music, I think about the way we used to rave back in the day. And I think I was fortunate to be born at a time when I could enjoy my life. I could enjoy the lover's rock. I could enjoy the soul, the Motown. I could enjoy all different types of music. We could go out, we could rave. I mean, yes, people still rave now, but the young people don't. Not to the, not like how we did. They don't seem to have the same sense of excitement and they don't seem to embrace um, the culture like we do. So they have a totally different um, skill set for how they enjoy themselves. So we had the blues and the shabines and the bottle parties and the nightclubs and the sandboxes. And that was our life. And there was little, um, there was, well, where I was, where I, I don't know about other places. I can't speak for other places. But where I went, I felt safe. And there was no fights. There was no trouble. There was no police. You just went to these parties, enjoyed yourself. You heard the birds singing in the morning when you were coming home, whether it's on the night bus or whether you got a lift at three or four in the morning or five or six in the morning. And that was how it was. Fashion was high class. We bought the best. Um, it was like the gabiches, Italian gabiches. It was the Burberry skirts. It was the Pringle. It was the um, Kango hats or the beaver, pure beaver skin. It was the um, crumby coats. It was, um, what do they call those suits? Um, tonic suits, all in different shades. It's the brogue shoes. I mean, crocodile shoes, cro crocodile belts, gold sovereigns, you know, gold bracelets, the watches. It was like Accurist back in the day. So we were the bee's knees. And all we used to do is work and save our money and buy the best. So back in the day, being black and British was like a community. Um, we all more or less did the same thing. There were some people who didn't put a priority or didn't feel as though they could afford, um, afford those expensive clothes. So they would buy the equivalent. You could get the equivalent from Marks and Spencers. So instead of getting a Burberry, they would get, the Marks and Spencer's equivalent, which was pleated skirt with the crisscross, but they just weren't Burberry. And they'd probably have the Ravels while we had the Russell and Bromley and the Pierre Cardin. And we'd have the Boucheron perfume and the men would be wearing Aramis. And Ah, oh, those were the days. They were the days. And I loved being black and British. And I still love being black and British. I just wish that the, um, the dark side of how black is portrayed. I just wish that wasn't, I, I wish, that, wish that wasn't there. So, and I wish um, the black British who are growing up now, I wish they were treated differently. I wish they had more of a fair chance. Because in my day, I think we had a fair chance. I think most blacks in Britain back in my day, so we'll talk about the 60s, 70s, 80s, we all had a fair chance. We had a fair chance at a job. We had a fair chance at education. We had a fair chance at everything. 
So, you know, we weren't competing with each other, white, black, whatever. You know, it was like we all had a fair chance. But these days, it doesn't feel as though um, young children, because I have to think I was a young person then. So I would say between, from the age of about 16, because I got my first job at 16, till the age of um, 27, 28, when I was working and before I had kids. Well, I did have one kid. Yeah. But anyway, all I'm saying is that I felt as though we had a fair chance where young people today, they don't seem to. I mean, yes, if you go to do education, but even now it's hard to get jobs and it's so difficult for young people today. And plus the way we entertained ourselves was more basic. It was just about music buying records, vinyls, every week we'd buy our music. And depending on what genre you liked, I was a reggae girl, even though I had a, a large soul collection, I was mostly lovers rock and reggae. But you'd have the other, you have those who kind of specialised in soul and maze and Richard Dimplefields and all that kind of stuff. And I was more Gregory Isaacs and Dennis Brown. So, but we, we kind of um, had a choice and we had a choice of how we enjoyed ourselves. And there seemed to be um, event managers or organisers that catered for each of us, for, regardless of what genre. But when I think about young people today, they don't seem to have the same, Black British today don't seem to have that same sense of choice. Not unless their choices are much more complex because of the electronic era or the technical era. I don't know. Anyway, um, so done the fashion, the housing. I used to live on a council flat because when I had my first child and I was in an abusive um, relationship, I scarpered and I ended up um, being able to get a council flat. And the council flats then nothing like the ones now, brand new, just built. Chalk Hill Estate, when I went there, it was beautiful. It was like a duplex. And I'll never forget, because it was my first home since after I left my mum, and I'll never forget that it was like a duplex, an own bedroom and a bathroom and everything, and everything was brand new. And um, I had a few friends that lived around the corner. And then after a few years, I had another child and then I was moved into another council estate and that was like a house. So it was like a masonette and you had an upstairs and downstairs and a garden. And once again, you know, because I was working, it was the best of the best. You save up for the best of the best. And I'd have the deep shag pile carpet, designer wallpaper from John Lewis, um, you know, and then I would, do, and then we had. I think IKEA was just about came in then, and I remember having a wall to wall and ceiling to floor wall unit because wall units were in then, and it and a leather sofa. And back in the day, when we got a leather sofa, we got the three pieces. So we got the sofa and two armchairs, and that's what you called a three piece suite. Nowadays, they sell them separately. But back in the days, that's what we had. And that's how we lived. And we were comfortable, paid our way, worked hard, saved for what we wanted. And that's what we did. So being black British for me and my experience, it was great. The only thing that made it not so great is probably my choices. But apart from that, I couldn't, I couldn't complain. I can't complain. So, um, racism. So this is where being black British kind of comes a bit shaky. As a child growing up, I never considered gollywogs on jam jars and the black and white minstrel show as being racist. But I hated being called a wog on the streets. And that's the thing, you know. But see, I remember seeing the, the, the jam jars with the gollywogs on it. I didn't associate myself as a gollywog, what I saw on that jar, because 
it was black as night and it had spiky hair and had big thick red lips and I remember it had like a little suit on a white shirt and some I think it had striped trousers and I can actually visualize that jam jar but there is no way I would have associated that with racism um, and that's what I mean as a child you don't see racism you don't see things like that and think oh that's racist and like with the black and white minstrel show it was entertainment and then you kind of think mm, why are they got those thick lips and why are they looking like that but I don't think I as a child I equated myself and thought they're trying to imitate me I don't think I did that so, and then we had um, programs like Love Thy Neighbours. So you're getting older now. You're a big person now. So you're recognising the subtleties of racism. And, well, it's not even subtle. I think it was quite blatant by the time Love Your Neighbour came on. And that reminded us that we were different. And the fact that there weren't black people on television. There was no black people on television until I think Love Thy Neighbour came on. So you didn't really... There was nothing to um, measure ourselves by. And we didn't have, um, I don't want to say role models, but there were no, apart from our family, they were all we had that we could identify as being the same colour as us. You know, there wasn't anybody else. So there was no famous black people that we knew of back in the day because they weren't in the history books we weren't taught about them so um let's see so education not taught about black history in school we did not know about black heroes and influencers as far back as 1500s in the uk john blank he was an african trumpeteer and he was on this big um scroll um De depicting the prestigious Westminster tournament in 1511. So we didn't even know that black people existed. It's almost like we thought we were led to believe that black people started with us. That's what it came like, or our parents, or at least the Windrush. That's That was the implication, that black people started in the UK with us. And before that, you know, there weren't no black people. So we're the ones that invaded England. That is the impression we were given as we were growing up and getting a bit more understanding of, you know, when the racism did start, when it was much more in your face. And so when you learn, I mean, I may be 30s, 40s, 50s, you learn about, Black people were in the UK as far back as the 1500s. They're kind of like, how come we weren't taught about that in school? When we, were taught, when we taught about all these other historians, why wouldn't they tell us about that? It, you know, it would just give it a little balance. It wouldn't make us think that there was just a white history, which is how we grew up. So being black and British... And not having any um, black people to identify, um, kind of, I'm not quite sure what it must have done to us mentally. Because now we can associate with lots of black people that we see in sports, whether it's Usain Bolt, whatever it is, we see lots of black people now. But I can imagine growing up as a child, how that would have impacted us. And when you think the most important years of a child is from the age of four until the age of eight. And they're not knowing or seeing any black people or hearing of any black people. And then you're going into the school system and you still don't hear of any black people apart from those in your classroom and those in your family. It kind of makes you think, oh, we're the only black people. There are. So when they pick on us, it's almost like they're justified to pick on us because we've invaded the country, not realising that blacks were here from the year of naught. But they've just been obliterated from the history books for some reason. 
I don't even know why they would want to obliterate it. What difference would it make if they just gave a balanced um, history of what went on back then? I mean, they're telling us now. So why couldn't they tell us back then? At least we'd have some kind of understanding and something to relate to and people to relate to. So we had, um, like I said, that John Blank, the Black, the African trumpeter, and that was 1511. Um, the Black Princess from Germany became the first queen when she married King George III in 1761. Um, we've got Aluda Aquiano, a distinguished Black British Georgian in Britain since Roman times. And he that, that shows that him, and the thing is, is that when you think about Equin, Equiano, you know, he had a senior role. But we're le we were led to believe growing up that the only roles that black people had were slavery or menial roles. But when you look in the history, black people were seniors and they had good roles and they, even, they were even treated as equals. It's not like racism existed all the time there were white people and black people living together working together i saw um a photograph i don't know if it was the independent or something of some kids in school some black kids and white kids all laughing it was 1934 and everybody looked happy nobody looked as though, oh my god who are these black people so it's something that has resurrected or something that has been nurtured recently it's, it wasn't going on like that all the time black people weren't always demonized and criminalized but only i don't know when it started but it started at some point to make the outside world or whoever feel that black people were the enemy, that black people are to be feared, that black people are criminals, that black people are this, that black people are that. But historically, black people were respected and they were respected and treated as equals by white people. So obviously we have a certain set of white people now who want to change that narrative and make it look like black people are demons. They're the bad guys. And if you have uh, if you have enough people saying it, and now we've got social media, it doesn't take very long to kind of reinforce that. And if you reinforce it enough, it becomes truth for some people. Some people don't question it, depending on the authority or depending on who's spreading the rumours, spreading the misinformation. The ivory bangle lady whose remains were discovered in York in 1901. That's now, she's now on display in the York Museum. And then, you know, we didn't know about Mary Seacole, Toussaint Louverture, Sam Sharp, Martin Luther King, Marcus Garvey, Nelson Mandela, Rosa Parks, Frederick Douglass, Jackie Robinson, Harriet Tubman, Sojourner Truth, Langston Hughes. I mean, there's loads and loads of black people, black people of merit, black people of substance that we did not know about growing up. Now we're all dying out, we hear about them. So, yeah, I put here, black people are deprived of any knowledge that would make us feel better about ourselves and equal hypervisibility, prosperity and achievement, well-being and aspiration is not promoted in black people. So all of those people, black people who were aspiring, that was kind of dumbed down. The hypervisibility is used to highlight black people as criminals. Poverty, low status. So because the UK erased the legacies of slavery and colonialism, and therefore it is difficult for others to understand why so many still suffer from post-traumatic stress by not knowing, probably made it easier to erase, easier to erase and racism growing up. I don't understand what I meant by that. 
Uh, the British language, when spoke um, properly, epitomizes privilege. And that's another thing. I remember back in the day, um, I have... I have my little cockney that I speak sometimes and then I speak proper English. And if you're going for a job, of course, you put on your proper English voice. And I remember um, back back then you would just call for a job and you'd say, they'd say, oh, what's your name? Oh, man, a lawyer. And where do you live? I live in Leesden in London. And, um, and how will you get here? Oh, you know, I don't live too far. It's not a difficult journey. Oh, we'd love for you to come for an interview. That's based on my voice. When they saw me, I mean, fortunately, I cannot say. They did say, oh, you know, I, I didn't expect you. You know, I, i.e. they didn't expect a person of colour. But I think I'm non-threatening. Definitely when I was younger. Um, non-threatening, clean, smart, conservative. So I got the job despite, based on the way I spoke. But, you know, back in the day, I mean, the English language is like a privilege. Like if you speak in America, it's like they go crazy when they hear the English voice. Not so much now, but I was in America, what, 25 years ago? And when I remember any time I spoke, oh, say that again, say that again. They were so enamoured by the English language. They probably got used to it by now. Um, what else have I got here? Yeah. Um, also, what I was found is that when I was, I was quite shocked when I went to America because if you're in one place, you've got nothing to compare it to. And because I was born in London, um, I only saw what was happening in London. So you'd see black people, like I said, family members. Um, you wouldn't see them on the TV. You definitely wouldn't see them, um, you know, monitoring hotels and cars, you know, at the car park. You know, get, you know, serving tickets and stuff like that. You wouldn't have seen them doing that back in the day. But when I went to America, what shocked me was that I got off of the plane in America and there were so many black people working in the airport. I'm like, bloody hell, where do all these black people come from? Working in the airport. Because in England, black people working in the airport, it was an absolute no-no. You wouldn't even see one. It was like a privi um, privileged, and I'm think I'm talking about 1989 here. I think that's when I went to, yeah, 1989. Yeah, I think I went to America in about 1989. So in 1989, there was lots of black people working in the airport because in America, those jobs were kind of menial jobs, but in England, even those jobs. Black people couldn't get. Anywhere where there was too much visibility, black people couldn't get a job. But in America, because they were considered menial, they got a job. And then I'd see black people outside the hotel as security or opening cars for people. What like, bloody hell? Black people on TV? It was like, it was such a shock. And I think, I don't know how it made me feel, to be honest. I think I was just shocked. I don't think, I was in the mindset that I would study it and reflect on it. I wasn't in that place. I was, you know, all I remember being was shocked. And then I would get more and more used to it. And I remember coming back in 2000 and there was still, I think maybe one black person I saw at the airport that he threw a one, I think. It was all white people and couples. And I remember that was another thing that made me feel uncomfortable because in America, if you're single, it didn't matter. But as soon as you got to England, there was this almost like an implied um, conform, an implied, an implied um, 
Anyway, it was just like it was implied that people should conform, you know, they should be in couples and stuff like that. And it was weird because you kind I remembered how it was before I left. When I, I didn't remember it while I was away, but when I came back, I realised what it was like. And when I came back, I thought, hmm, I don't know if I'm going to like England. But because it's my home and I'm used to it and I felt as though I knew the culture, I knew how to fit in, you know, that is what I was basing my judgment on and I was lucky that when I came in I still I came back at a time when you could still walk into a solicitor's office and have an interview based on your personality and your character and I remember walking into the solicitor's office and I said you know I'm a legal secretary even though I hadn't done it for quite a while I said, I'm a legal secretary by background and um, I'd love to have a job. And they said, when can you start? And I started two weeks later because it was the Christmas holidays. And I started, I think, the second day in the new year. And it was interesting because I, it, that felt like home. And I thought, ah, oh, yes, everything, this is, England is the same as how I left it. But after 2000, things started changing. I started learning that, you know, whereas England had that brand of reliability and trust, and when I was doing up my home, I kind of gave out cash to do this and cash to do that because I had that trust mentality for Brits and British tradesmen. And I was lucky I didn't get ripped off. But after that, I heard about these um, traders, these rogue traders. And I thought I had a lucky break. And then after 2000, it just seemed as though things started deteriorating. And, you know, standards started deteriorating. You know, Marks and Spencers, that used to be the standard for clothing. We knew if you got underwear from Marks and Spencers, it was the best. If you got to British home stores, that wasn't so great, but, you know, it was okay. But after a while, it started losing its class. And that's what I can only say. England is losing its class. And it's not down to immigrants while it's losing its class. It's almost like people have stopped caring And everybody's strive for greed and making money and sending stuff out to different countries so they can get things done cheaper. And so the quality isn't as good. And then because everybody's striving for cheapness now over quality, the standards have got poorer and poorer. Anyway, I don't know if I'm going off um, track with my black Britishness, but... Okay, let me see. Let me find out if I've got more I've got to say. Um, UK UK is also quite ageist, I find. People's perception of the eld- elderly. They have a stereotype. Shock and horror when they discover my age, usually. It's just like, oh, really? Oh, my God. You don't look that age. You're kind of like, how are you supposed to look? You have a stereotype of how people look. There is no uh, way that people are supposed to look. You don't have to be bending over with a walking stick and riddled with arthritis. That doesn't have to happen. But when people are saying, oh, my God, you don't look that age. You look like you're in your 40s or your 50s. You know, you're kind of like, that's because you have a stereotype of what age is. And England is quite ageist because you do find the little comments they make about, oh, you know, once you're a certain age, oh, you're going to remember this, you're going to remember that. And, oh, do you think you should be working? And, oh, do you think, you know, have you started looking for your funeral home? And have you done your funeral plan? And all this kind of rubbish and all these um, things that come to your letterbox about your funeral plan and life insurance and 
all this kind of stuff. I mean, please. But that is ageism. They, they assume that a certain age has to conform to a certain lifestyle. You can't wear certain clothes. You shouldn't be doing this. You shouldn't be wearing that. It's absolutely ridiculous. But that is the ageism. The, um, I mean, they have laws about ageism. They have laws about discrimination. It doesn't really take away the innate, you know, the conditioning that people have. So, being black in Britain, um, I volunteer on the police panel, as you know. So I know that black boys are um, stopped indiscriminately for stop and search. That doesn't make me feel good as a black British. I think about my grandson, who's 18, and I think, you know, when I think about those black boys being indiscriminately, it makes me scared, scared for my grandson. So when I think about being black and British, and I think about him more than myself, my experience being black and British, have, has, I've been quite fortunate. But when I think about young boys growing up being black and British, they're not having the same experience as what I had. So my heart goes out to them. Um, and I think of the black men who are stopped randomly, taken aside, waiting in detention centres or, wait, you know, hauled into um, prison cells while the immigration does a check on them. They can't call their parents, their phones are taken away, they're treated like criminals. My heart goes out to them as black British. And a lot of them are black British. And that's the thing that the police have problems with because you can't tell who's black British and who's a foreign national just by the colour of your skin. So they have to just take everybody in randomly if they're trying to get the illegal immigrants. But the sad thing is, is that the black British suffer because the police are trying to find the illegal immigrants, the foreigners. So we're all kind of put under the same umbrella, which is sad. I think of the Windrush generation who were black British and who were told that they were not because they didn't have the supporting paperwork. So my heart goes out to them. Um, appreciate how many white people are coming together to defend black people. That is so wonderful to see. And that is the England that I grew up with. The England where white people and black people we're together. We work together. We laugh together. We have fun together. And there's still people that do that. But there's this overarching, um, I don't even know what, cloud that kind of takes away our joy, that makes us feel uncomfortable. Can't quite settle down and feel comfortable because we don't know quite what's going on. And then we're constantly reminded like I said, with all these videos of what it's like to be black. We just happen to be black and British. But what is it like to be black and Ukrainian, black and Russian, black and African, black and Caribbean, black and Indian, black and Chinese? What is it like? They all have the same experience. So regardless of whether it's black British, as long as it's black, it seems to have this cloud over it. And that never used to be there. So my experience of being black and British was, I can only say, a privileged experience. Um, I've got here unstable. Yeah, sometimes I feel unstable because we hear about Boris siding with Ukraine and Ukraine having a history of neo-Nazism when Russia has never attacked Africa. So I feel tentative because we do just do not know who is pulling the strings and what is happening. And so I hope that gives you a good idea of how I feel being black and British. I hope I didn't go too much off of the rails, but that's all for now. Bye-bye.